Right. Good evening, everyone. I hope uh, you are well. Um, and thank you again for joining me. My name is Andrew Beck from Wild Eye. And as you would have guessed this evening, we are going to be w taking a journey through Botswana's Okavango Delta. Um, just as we go through, uh, see the number of participants are, are climbing slowly. I'm just going to wait for everyone to kind of join in. Um, but uh, please do drop us a note. You'll see that there's a chat section. If you'd like to drop a note there, let us know where you're from, where, you're, where in the world you're tuning in for this journey through the Okavango Delta. Um, I know many guests who have already experienced the Okavango Delta with me are tuning in just to kind of remember what they have experienced in the past. And um, yeah, so for those of you who haven't joined a webinar with the Wildlife team yet, you've got a Q&A section at the bottom of the panel. So I'm going to be running the chat window on the side as well, um, but there is a Q&A section. And uh, hopefully I'll have a little bit of time towards the end of the, the chat just to kind of field some questions and uh, provide some answers with you uh, or for you all on the Okavango Delta. So I think probably in the next uh, couple of minutes, we're going to get things going, but uh, hello to everyone. People, hey, Nicholas from all the way from Switzerland, uh, from Geneva, uh, Lucas as well from Belgium, all the way from Durban, Charlotte, welcome, thanks for joining us. And wow, isn't this incredible? So all the way from Toronto and Canada, lovely to have you joining us, Rebecca. Um, yeah, so just by a quick show of hands, how many people have actually been to the Okavango Delta? If you just wanna throw some chats in there, uh, some comments, um, just see that uh, we have Sure, quite a few hands going up there. That's fantastic. Now, now do I ask how many of you would love to go back? And I pretty much would imagine that almost everyone who has been um, will go back at some point. It's an incredible place, a very diverse part of the world. Um, really incredible. So I'm going to try and get the slideshow going on a full screen for us here. Um, just give me a second. Right, uh, let's get going. Uh, just give me one minute here. So guys, just to, again, you know, on the Q&A side of things, if you can, um, if you can ask and just add those questions to the bottom of the, um, uh, of the Q&A panel as we go through, uh, I think that's going to be the best way. And I'd hope to try and get this going on a full screen, but I think we are going to have to try. Let's see if I can get this going here. Right, there we go, back in the game. So unfortunately, I can't see any of the chat section going through here now, um, but I think it's a much better visual experience for you all if I have this on full screen. So please, as we go along, if you have any questions, please drop them in that Q&A section and I will get to them um, as we get to the end of the presentation. So one of the big things that so many people ask, and it's a bit of a confusing thing, is the seasonality of the Okavango Delta. So. Um, why on earth is there a flood at the peak of the dry season? It just doesn't make any sense. Well, if you take it a, a little bit further and you start to unpack this, um, it really does start to make sense. So obviously down in the Southern Hemisphere here and for most of Southern Africa, our rainy season is um, during the summer months. So typically from about November, December, all the way through to the end of March and April. And if you have a look on the map here, you can quite clearly see the Okavango Delta over here. Um, kind of spreads out into that fan-like uh, pattern onto the Kalahari Sands. But if you trace this all the way back up, you can see this mountainous section up on the top here. And that goes to show, that kind of gives you an idea of where the waters come from. So whilst there's rain falling in the Okavango Delta during the summer months, it's actually the rains from Angola that need to slowly make their way down to the Okavango Delta in order to fill it up and then bring on that flood. So if we were to try and break this down into a much more uh, simplistic view, I like icons, um, rains will be falling in Angola all the way through from November till about the end of April. And slowly but surely that water makes its way down south following the course of rivers until it hits the, um, the Gumari fault line. So if you can picture from a tectonic plate perspective, there's really two fault lines that shape the delta. 
The first one runs across just a little bit higher than where I've drawn there now, and I'm uh, sorry, just a little bit lower than that, um, is the Gumari fault line. And then down at the bottom here, just near Mount, is the Tamalakani fault line. So what happens is the, the waters flow down, they hit this fault line, and then all of a sudden things just span out onto the, the floodplain, and the water just spills away. Um, and floods this entire area, giving rise to that delta-like landscape that we have there. And um, the, the next phase in this whole journey is that the floodwaters continue to come through from about the end of April all the way through into May. They keep pushing down. And that's obviously now in the peak of the winter period where there's no rainfall whatsoever. And this massive volume of water has come down from Angola, arrives in the Okavango Delta, and then we get the peak of the flooding in July. So that is a very basic, a very simplistic kind of explanation of why we're able to experience a flood in the middle of the dry season. Um, and interestingly enough, it's not just those flood waters from Angola that, that kind of shape the, the flood itself. It's obviously the rainfall in, that falls in the Delta during the summer months. So for example, last year in Southern Africa, it was a very dry year with incredible droughts um, throughout Southern Africa. And the Okavango Delta had very little rain. And then there was kind of below average rainfall in Angola as well. So the floods were um, almost a, a no-show at the end of last year. So and we'll come to it when I, I start to take you on a bit of a journey through the Okavango Delta and on one of our safaris. But uh, camps which were traditionally completely surrounded by water, um, where boating activities were offered year round, were actually left high and dry. So it's a fascinating system. It changes year on year. And this year they're having incredible floods. It's, it's quite crazy when no one can travel, all the wild dogs seem to have pups in the most accessible of dens. The leopards have all got cubs. And um, of course, one of the inc most incredible floods in a number of years has hit the Okavango Delta. But it's these floodwaters that push through from Angola that just kind of flood this landscape. And it really is an incredible, um, beautiful, diverse landscape. Seasonality and when to go is a big question. Um, and I, the way that I've approached this in, in the way that we've structured our tours into Botswana is that you have to box clever and try and get the best of both worlds. Now, what does that mean? So if we were to break this up um, across the, the year, we've got months on the left-hand side there when the floodwaters are arriving. Um, the typical season, you know, you would have heard things like green season, the shoulder season and peak season. And um, the rates differ dramatically between these seasons. And then on the right-hand side there, we have rainfall. Now, for a lot of people, they don't want to go on safari when there's rain. Um, but, you know, in this part of the world, it's really, we dominate with uh, late afternoon thunder showers rather than extended periods of, of rain. So if you look at it, um, if you were to go January, February, March, and April, you're probably not going to get the full expanse of the flood waters that would be coming through. Towards the end of April, they may arrive um, May, June, July, and August. Um, that's when the floods are really kind of coming through. And that's obviously the peak season as well. The peak season extending all the way into October, um, where the flood waters would have then started to uh, recede in September and October. Um, in terms of the rainfall from about March, April, April onwards, there's very little rain all the way through until about October, November, um, when you start to get the first of the afternoon thunderstorms. Now for photography, that is fantastic. You start to get some features in the sky and it balances the scene. There's um, new life with impala lambs starting to be born. There's a little bit of greenery coming through, but the bush has all kind of been mowed down through uh, grazing pressure throughout the dry season. So there's really two areas that we like to con kind of concentrate on. And it's those shoulders periods, because literally from the end of October, the 31st of October to the 1st of November, the, the rates drop significantly. Now, the end of October, is, you know, October in, in the Delta is suicide month, incredibly hot, um, very dry. And so animals tend to congregate around the waters, which makes for great game viewing. But it's really not that different in November. But Botswana being a kind of low volume, um, high cost tourism destination, uh, the shoulder seasons really do give you good bang for buck. Um, really, the only two periods that I would hesitate going through is, is February and, and maybe even March. And the reason that I say that is because that's the peak of the growing season. So the grass tends to be a little bit longer. Um, you tend to work a little bit harder for your sightings. 
And, and so those times of year are, are fantastic and really good value for money, but great experience at the same time. Um, and I'll show you some examples of the images that I've ex seen and experienced. And just one other thing with the, the peak of the floodwaters coming through, what that does do is it also makes certain areas inaccessible. So lines will cross over a channel and move onto an island, but the vehicle may not be able to go there. So, you know, they could camp out on that island trailing buffalo for a week and it becomes very difficult for, for game viewing. Whereas in the drier periods, um, when the floodwaters are not at their peak, you have a little bit more room to maneuver and can access more areas. So let's have a look at uh, traveling through Botswana. And really there, there's two ways to do this. There's the private concessions and the, the national parks. And that really comes down to lodges and mobile camping as a, as a comparison. And um, I've done both. I've been visiting Botswana probably for the last 11 years now, I think was the, you know, 11 years ago was the first time that I visited. I've done the mobile camping trips um, and I've also done the lodge based trips and they're, they're all incredible. For a lot of people, Botswana becomes a self-drive destination. A lot of um, off-roading and uh, vehicles which have been kitted out with rooftop tents and that sort of thing. And you can do it, you know, if you get the right maps and you get into the right places, booking campsites are uh, still quite expensive. Um, and you have to get in early. So um, it's an incredible experience. And just to give you an idea of what, um, whoopsie, let's go back here. Just to give you an idea of what a lot of self drives would do is, you know, kind of start off in mound down in the, in the bottom over here, maybe pick up a vehicle through there or drive. And then they kind of move along to the Moremi area, third bridge uh, around Kakanaka, and then come back through the Mapani towards Kwai. Um, and then on the other side of the Kwai, there's a beautiful area called the Kwai Community Reserve. So basically the community on the northern side of the Kwai River, um, outside of the National Park, have put this land aside for conservation and for wildlife. So there are a couple of uh, private lodges out there, but there's also a fantastic public campsite called Makotlo, um, where you get to uh, literally camp in the bush. Really, really good game viewing, good for leopards. And then from here, the route typically kind of moves up towards Savuti and the Savuti Channel, and then cutting through um, along the Chobe Forest Reserve up to Ngorma around along to Kasani, where you finish on the Chobe River. People would then usually drop their vehicle off there and fly out. So that would be a typical kind of mobile safari through there. But what you will notice is that there are vast areas of the actual Okavango Delta proper that you're not getting into. Um, and so that's where you really then need to maybe spend a little bit more and um, at, look at the private concessions. The mobile camping safaris are incredible. The public sites are fairly well spaced out. And um, if you go with a professional operator, they have separate sites. And those sites are a couple of kilometers away. So you can literally be the only people in the site. And it's raw, it's wild, it's fantastic. And I absolutely love it. We've had some incredible game viewing, like I've said, in the Kwai area for leopards is really, really good. Um, Savuti for elephants, especially in the late dry season where there's not a lot of water around there. They have to come down to those water holes twice daily um, to drink. And you can really have some great experiences. And then finishing that whole setup with a, um, a, a houseboat uh, on the Chobe River actually crossing into Namibia for this portion of it um, is really a, a great way to do it. And that's the kind of mobile safari that we, we have offered in the past. So we did 11 nights on the mobile camping and then finished with three nights on the houseboat. So a full two week journey through Botswana, but um, you're just kind of skirting along the edges of the Okavango Delta. And what I wanted to focus on today was a, a kind of retracing our steps through the Botswana Wilderness Safari. It's a, a trip that I've hosted for a number of years now. Um, took me a long time to put together the right itinerary to give guests the right experience and the combination of camps and the, one of the things with the Delta is you can't just go to one camp and I'll show you why now because the area is just so diverse you, you're just going to be touching on little bits so to try and put the right combination of camps together to give people that would go to the Okavango Delta only once in their lifetime the, the ability to say yes I've, I've really experienced the Okavango Delta. And that's really where this itinerary came about. And if you look at where the camps that we visit on this itinerary are located, you'll see that they really are in the heart of the Okavango Delta, a very different area to the rest of the kind of mobile safari type uh, destinations that you would get to. Um, and that comes with a number of benefits, obviously not having other self-drive vehicles and campers around 
um, around you. And if we just zoom in a little bit more, you would be able to kind of see and get an idea now from the actual location within the Okavango Delta, where the different camps are located. You've obviously got uh, Chiefs Island right in the middle here. Um, this is quite a prime piece of real estate. And you can imagine with all of that water flooding down from the north, all of those minerals being deposited on the northern part of this island. Um, really, really good game viewing there. One of the most famous camps in the Delta, um, Chiefs Camp, but also Mombo Camp located in um, or on Chiefs Island rather. So let's get into it. How on earth do we get into these places and where do we start with this itinerary? Well, we fly in from Mound and this is something that becomes quite an interesting um, challenge for photographers, especially when you're moving through the Okavango Delta is um, moving between these camps is only possible by air. A, a 30 minute flight would normally take um, some of the supply trucks six to nine hours, depending on the quality of the road. So you certainly don't want to drive into or between these lodges. And uh, this is pretty much the, the stock standard aircraft that would be used to get guests between the camps, um, a Cessna caravan. And one of the biggest challenges we face as photographers is the weight limit on these internal flights. Um, typically 20 kilograms per person. Now any um, photographer worth his, his metal would know that your camera bag probably weighs twice that. So how do we get around it? Um, on all of the packages that we have, we've actually had to purchase an additional seat, which gives you extra weight and is then evenly distributed amongst all of our guests. Um, one of the things that I always say with, with traveling to Botswana and these places where there are weight restrictions and luggage limits is that you must remember that your camp will more than likely offer laundry services. So you, you can pack light. Um, so it's all about priorities. And if you're a photographer, then, you know, maybe one or two pairs of uh, uh, pants, some shirts, lightweight uh, jersey and jacket. And of course, as long as the camera bag is fully stocked, then you're good to go. Um, but it is a concern and it is a challenge. There's set dimensions and they're very strict with this, especially in the, the, the later season where it's quite hot and they do need to be cautious about how much weight they take on um, when flying between these areas. So if you are planning on that and you are a photographer, do think about that. Um, it does come at a bit of a cost, um, but I tell you what, it, is, it really is worth it. And from a group perspective, with the group departures that we do, once that seat is split evenly amongst the guests, it's, um, it makes for quite a bit of extra weight. I think our luggage restrictions go up from 20 up to 35 kilograms per person, which is, is more than manageable. As you can see, the private camps are very, very basic, very rustic. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, we, we're not choosing these areas and I haven't chosen the camps in the, in, for this itinerary based on the luxury. Um, it's more about the location. It just so happens that these are the only camps in those areas and the best camps in those areas. And um, it's more about the location than it actually is the camp. But this is a typical room um, at Chitabi camp with the bathroom and uh, shower out in the back section there. Um, Chitabi itself has actually just been through a rebuild now and um, it's looking fantastic. Not that any of our photographic guests get to spend too much time around the pool. Usually when we're coming back between game drives, we're, we're editing Lightroom, uh, doing Lightroom sessions in the library area or charging camera gear before the next drive. But the camps are absolutely fantastic. You'll see that there's almost no brick and mortar um, in the camps in the Okavango Delta. A lot of them are tented camps. But, you know, if you look at that room on the previous side there, that, that is a tent. Um, believe it or not. So when you, you know, if you're, if it's a first time traveling to these places and we talk about a tented camp, um, it's certainly not necessarily the, the roughing and roughing it and camping tent that you would be accustomed to. I just want to zoom in a little bit more on the area now. So that red pin there is the Tatabi camp itself. And I'm um, just going into a little bit more detail here. We have the um, Gomorti channel, which kind of runs through on this eastern side here. And that's the boundary into Moremi National Park on this side over here. You can see there's the Southgate campsites. Um, and the Chitabi concession, really these guys are working this strip all the way along down to this section over here. Um, yeah, maybe a little bit more. So a beautiful area and you can see quite diverse. Um, the green obviously shows some of the, the uh, uh, wetland where water would flood through and push through, but you can also see there's very much um, a kind of sandy ridge which runs through the middle of the concession. So a good mix and diversity. 
Game viewers in the area, this is a typical vehicle. The trip that we do, we have a maximum of four guests. And as you can see, everyone would then get a seat on the left-hand side. Um, open game viewers and more than enough space, nice camera rests. And the diversity in this part of the world is incredible. Um, everything from pinkback pelicans who in the later part of the dry season are feeding in lagoons and you know, feeding in these fish traps where the water starts to recede and you can have hundreds of pelicans, storks, egrets, uh, it, herons, it's just unbelievable. Um, there's quite a bit of water around this part of the delta, uh, even towards the latter part. So there's some permanent lagoons and channels that flow. So chances of getting scenes like this are, are fairly common. But what I really love about the southern part of the delta and why we start here is the predator viewing. So not as much water, but the southern section is just so rich. And especially in, le in leopard, I've had some of the best leopard sightings that I can recall um, in the delta around the Chitabi camp. This was a female and her youngster that we spent time with one morning. Just only vehicle in the sighting, no pressure. Same youngster up a tree. Um, and it's just been an incredible opportunity to spend time with these cats. Obviously, in these private concessions, the vehicles are allowed to go off-road. Um, they are they in the area regularly, so they have these known individuals. The animals are a little bit more habituated. They regulate the sightings to a maximum of three vehicles at a time. Um, you have multiple vehicles out from the camp, so the guys are in touch with one another and always communicating. So your chances of seeing these kind of things are, are just so much greater than in, in most other places. Um, and the, the big cat action doesn't just stop with the leopards. We've had some incredible lion sightings. Those of you who know me will, will know that I'm fond of some more abstract images that may be just one step too far, but it is a lion. It's a biased interpretation of a lion. But the lions of this area are really quite special. Um, what you get on the edge of the wetlands is the sawgrass, which makes for beautiful foregrounds and backgrounds. And you just need a, a big male lion to poke his head up like this guy did, um, just for a, a couple of seconds, just to get a really great shot. And then in the dry season, the, that sandy ridge, which is covered in these beautiful grasses, just provides some of the most incredible photography, um, good light. And the other thing about these private concessions is we're out well before sunrise, getting into prime areas where we can surround ourselves with photographic opportunities at good light. The lions in this area are also known for um, focusing and attempting to hunt giraffe more regularly than in many other areas. There are a lot of giraffes that occur in the southern part of the delta here, so it may just be an adaptation to the, the number of um, giraffes that are in the area. And this was uh, one of the hunts and chases that we were fortunate to, to witness. Um, it didn't uh, end so well for the lioness on this occasion. The giraffe did get away. However, this pride really does have great success at hunting big game and pulling down giraffe on a regular basis. It's also one of the few areas in the delta where um, I've had really good cheetah sightings and um, it's, it's great to, to be able to see cheetah in the wild. It's really not, a, not often that you get to see cheetah these days, you know, apart from going to Tanzania and East Africa, it's not very common. Um, and on top of that, they've They've also got dogs. I mean, the show just gets better as we go on. Um, one, one afternoon we spent with a pack of about 30 dogs. And uh, this is what was left of the pack uh, after, I think it was about 10 or 12 of the adults had kind of anchored this Impala Ram. The rest of the pack came bolting in. Um, as soon as the, the youngsters and the, the females had got, got the Impala down, those 10 or 12 ran off to go and hunt again because 30, uh, 30 wild dogs will just, you know, one impala is not going to be enough. But again, one of the big things about these private concessions is we'd seen where the dogs were in the morning, we'd located them, and we made the call that we were going to head out there first thing in the afternoon. So we left at about two o'clock, I think it was, or half past two. We drove for about an hour to get up to the northern part of the concession where the dogs were, and we sat with them. We wanted to be there because we knew that they were going to hunt. 30 miles like this are not going to sit and do nothing. So we wanted to get there early. We wanted to get the interaction, and we wanted to spend time with them as they went on the hunt. I feel like I may be leaving this up here for too long, so let me move along. But the point there is that we have the flexibility to get out and to make the most of the time on safari. And that's very important um, when you're out on a photographic safari or you're going to a bucket list destination, which you may never return to. And the lodges here are very much about making that experience possible for the guests. 
Um, Tabi in that area also regularly has active hyena dens and um, it's really great to dedicate one afternoon to just going sitting outside one of these dens watching the little guys come out and interacting with the adults or with their siblings um, and other youngsters so really really good fun and good photography there's also a number of um, shallow pools in that dry area that get flooded during the, the wet uh, season uh, so with the rains and these hippo bulls will disperse between channels and maybe be moving across those areas and will just kind of sit up in there. And um, obviously when a vehicle comes past and it's mainly surrounded by dry land, they, they're not the happiest of campers. What I've really enjoyed about doing this itinerary a number of times is that I find sweet spots um, for photography. You get the lay of the land, but also within camp. Um, these two palms are actually lit up it's on one of the walkways in camp. There's uh, just those little ambient lights that you have on the edge of the walkway. Um, and that's enough just to kind of fill the palms whilst you've got the stars. And this is something that's a bit of a challenge in so many other parts of, of Africa. If you want to go out and photograph the night sky, you've got to get your guide up, you've got to go out after dinner, you've got to drive to a nice place to get an anchor. And um, often it becomes quite quite painstaking and, and you know the guides, the local guides on the ground are maybe just not that into it. Um, this is literally within camp and we walk along the, the boardwalk to get there and it's a great shot and um, it's just really, really cool to play and experiment and you'll see another camp in the, in the camp in the in the itinerary, uh, we also get a great opportunity to do a similar sort of thing. So that's essentially Chitabi in a nutshell. We spend um, three nights there on uh, at the start of our safari, and I tell you what, it is nonstop action. This is a place where I I can spend weeks on end here. It really is great, very diverse, and I've got a, a really good friend um, and guide on the ground there, Lesh who um, I request for our groups and we just work really well together. So a great place. So after three nights from there, um, again, we hop into another plane and a flight and we fly over the southern section of Chiefs Island up to the north uh, western part of the Okavango Delta. And if you can look at that just from an aerial perspective, you can see that the terrain is going to be very, very different at the second camp. And it really is. This is Pelo Camp. Um, it's in the Jiao concession and this area is typically permanently flooded and I say typically because when I was there in November there was literally no water. Let me just kind of give you an example here. Um, there was no water between Chiefs Island and uh, this section here. So there was literally no water there whatsoever. And this is an area that is typically water-based camp. Um, they were telling you that you're not really going to do too many game drives. The focus is on other things. Um, it's a beautiful little camp. Pelo means heart and it is on a heart-shaped island. So when the floodwaters are high, you land at an airstrip, you do a short drive to a boat station, probably 20 minutes by a power boat, and then you arrive at the camp. Um, it's a slightly smaller camp than most. Uh, this is an, an adventures camp, so the tent is not as big as uh, it is at Chitabi, but still very luxurious, more than enough space. And um, when we're there, we, we're taking um, five rooms out of the six rooms that are there. So these camps are not big. It's not like a safari lodge in South Africa where there may be 30 um, different rooms. All of these camps are really around about six rooms each. So when, when you are there, it's, it's quite nice and it's small and it's intimate. And if you zoom in onto this as a, from a, a landscape level, you'll see that you are surrounded by floodplains. So all of that would be translated into papyrus reed beds, um, oxbow lagoons, channels and river systems that are moving through as the water comes through from the north. And then just to orientate yourself, if you have a look out to the east there, there's Mombo Camp, which is on that northeast, uh, northwestern corner of Chiefs Island. A beautiful camp where the, the focus here is on water-based activities. And the reason that I've included this camp um, for two nights in the itinerary is to give people this opportunity um, to get out onto the water in a motorboat, onto a Mokoro, and experience the Delta. So it's, yes, it's about photography, but it's also about experience. I think you'd be cheated if you went to the Delta and you didn't get onto a Mokoro or you didn't see the floodplains and you didn't see this, this massive expanse and volume of water that you would out here. Um, so the guides are fantastic. They kind of take you out in the afternoon for your activity on a Mokoro. And it's about experiencing and just soaking up the smaller things. So looking at the lilies, looking at the grasses, looking for painted reed frogs. Um, the guides are fantastic at pointing out the, the small little details here. And it's quite a, a piece 
peaceful experience. So you can imagine the contrast of bumbling around on the back of a game drive vehicle, you know, very exciting, lots of photographic opportunities with the big cats to coming to a camp where you're, you've just got to sit and relax. It's not bumpy, it's quiet, it's peaceful. And it's a nice way to just kind of break the itinerary a little bit. Um, it's also a hotspot for these big fluffy orange owls, which if there are any birders around here, I can tell you now, this is a concession that you need to get to because I've not stayed at Pelo Camp without seeing a Pell's fishing owl. Um, this particular one was photographed in camp. You can see the Makoro there. This is just in front of the rooms, in fact. And um, for those of you who don't know, this is on every birder's list. It's a very rare fishing owl. It hunts at night. You can see those very big eyes, big talons. And um, they love this part of the delta. When it's flooded, it's the shallow waters, nice still, big trees for them to nest in and to roost in. And um, the Pelo Camp itself is a great roosting site for these guys. They've nested there a couple of times um, over the years. And like I said, I've always been fortunate enough to see these Pels fishing owls. But back to the Makoro experience, it really is quite special. It's so different. And for those of you who are afraid of things like hippos and crocodiles, it's really not much to be concerned about in the particular areas that we're offering these activities within the camps that we've chosen. Um, the waters are very shallow. The polars are very experienced and they know this part of the delta like the back of their hands. And the opportunity is to see the smaller things like these little painted reed frogs, which around the fire in the evenings, you hear them tinkering. And for those of you who've been to the Delta, you'll know that sound and it's such a, such a peaceful sound. But there's also other opportunities, some more abstract shots, uh, you know, just to document the Delta in its totality. And, you know, it would be sad to go and just come away with images of lions and leopards and cheetahs and all of these things. Well, not sad, but, um, you know, to try and capture the diversity of the Delta, to have a water-based camp like this, where you can get out onto the boat, you can stop on an island for coffee in the morning, and the pace is just a little bit more different. These are some uh, uh, aquatic grasses just panning across with a slow shutter speed as the motorboat is cruising along. Um, just trying something different, trying to capture and create something interesting. The, the guides in the area will also often take some of the plants and make beautiful necklaces with a lily. Um, I haven't got one yet, but I think they do tend to focus more on the ladies. Um, but it's, it's great to see some of the craft. They also will talk to you about their heritage, where they've come from, and the different tribes within the Okavango Delta. And it's quite fascinating because there were um, certain tribes or portions of tribes that were more adapted to the aquatic environment and living in these islands and poling between uh, areas and fishing. And that's where Makoros actually came from, was actually moving between the areas, but also carrying the produce and um, the, the fish that they'd caught between the fishing camps and the, the local villages. The bird life in the area is fantastic. And I know one of the questions was around when is the best time to go and see these birds? And really, you know, there's always going to be a large number of aquatic birds around there. Um, but I think the best time would probably be during the summer months when the summer migrants are around. But having said that, you know, things like the slaty egret, the black heron, um, the purple heron, there's so many different bird species around. I don't think that you could ever go there without being um, excited and uh, having your your birding fix. But overall, um, being on a Mokoro in the Okavango Delta, Kerry, I think you were going to tune in today as well. I think this would be a happy memory for you. Um, it really is an incredible experience. And to have this camp in there is, and I, it's quite funny that I'm going to say this because it, last year, it was completely not the case, but it almost guarantees this water-based experience. Last year's drought was the exception. Um, and not far away from where we were Mokoroing, um, and on that year, this is the sighting that we had. So you can see that this whole area is usually flooded all the way up to the tree line in the baobab in the background there. So essentially what I'm saying is that water would normally be up to the edges over here. Um, and last year in November, it was completely bone dry, um, which made for some incredible game viewing though. So palm thickets and islands which would normally have water a meter up um, were then becoming resting places for, for lions. And um, it was behind one of these water-based camps, which is usually completely flooded um, at that time of year, that we had uh, this male lion and his brother actually pull down not one, but two buffalo. So the dry season and these extreme conditions make for incredible game viewing as well, although it would have been great to, to experience a bit more water around the camp. 
But this is also a fantastic camp and opportunity to step out and just photograph the night sky. Because it's on an island, you're fairly safe. And there's a beautiful patch just behind the, the rooms itself, between the staff village and, and the rooms where there's a walkway and um, slightly raised. There's a beautiful palm tree that we can use as an anchor. And um, it's a nice opportunity because you can go there, you leave your camera for 45 minutes to do this long exposure and shoot the star trail pop back to the lodge, have a glass of wine. When the time is done, head back out there and it's quite safe. You don't have to get into a vehicle and go anywhere. There's very little light pollution apart from a little bit of light that seeps in from the left-hand side of frame from the staff village. But you know, there's not many places that you can do this in the camp um, and with that flexibility. And so it's, a, it's something that I always try and encourage and a shot that I always try and help our guests get when we're out on safari. So after two nights at Pelo, and I think that is the sweet spot, um, you know, after two nights, you're kind of getting ready to get going again. You want to see some action, get back onto a game viewer. You've experienced the, the motorboat, you've experienced the Makoro, you've seen the Pels Fishing Owl. We, we hop onto a plane again, and this time, it's a fairly short hop to the northeast to the Boomborough concession. And what must be one of the most incredible camps um, is Little Boomborough Camp. Um, it's located on an island, um, and in this concession, there is another camp, which is Bumbara Plains, and there's North and South Camp there, but that is a premier camp, so it's essentially, you know, the, the, the top, the cream of the crop, rooms are bigger, um, instead of having a communal dining with um, uh, a buffet style meal, it would be plated, and uh, so it, it's not necessarily a camp that we need for photography. We want to be in that area, but we don't necessarily need to, to have the big room that we're not going to really be doing much else other than sleeping and downloading in. So the Little Vumbara Camp is a fantastic way to finish this trip. And this is where we spend four nights. Um, you can see the rooms here are a little bit bigger. Um, so it's not the adventure camp that is Pelo. It's maybe a little bit bigger than, a, than the classic camp um, at Chitabi as well. But really beautiful views, beautiful room, outdoor shower um, and a pool and just a great location. And if I zoom in here, you, you may pick up on one or two um, of the other well-known camps. There's uh, Duba Plains out in the corner here, which is the Great Plains property. And then um, the other premier camp that I was talking about there, Bumbara Plains, uh, Bumbara North and Bumbara South. And then um, Little Bumbara is on that little island that you can see there where that red pin is. And this is an incredibly diverse concession. You can see up to the north, you've got the Kalahari Sands and those dry areas, but down to the south, there's a lot of water and there's a lot of channels and diversity. Um, this camp always has water. So if you were going to the Delta, and even last year, I actually, you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to send um, my folks up to the Delta on a trip that they'd been planning for years and years. And I included the Vumbara concession for this exact reason, is that I know that there's always water there. Um, so even last year, November, when, when we were at Pelo, there was nothing. There was good water, almost as if there was normal flooding taking place um, at Bumbara Plains. So a great place to, to go and hedge your bets if you want to get water and land-based activities in one, uh, one camp. The vehicles here are slightly different, and you can just see that they're built for, um, for going through deep channels and traversing these, uh, the waterways um, on a regular basis. But again, with just four guests, everyone's seated on the left-hand side so that when we pull into sightings, there's no, no obstructions or anything like that. Um, beautiful vehicles. They've actually got a, quite a new fleet. And just touching on kind of the, what they need to cover, um, you can see I th there's actually a video here. So I'm not too sure how this is going to render from a sound perspective. So if you want to dial down your sound a little bit, um, you can kind of get an idea of what we drive through. So those, uh, those vehicles are really purpose built and there's always water around there. And so the opportunities for photographing wildlife in water, which is something that is so iconic um, from the Okavango Delta perspective is around every corner, whether it's elephants, the red lechwe at first light, um, you know, moving through and they will often jump over these, these roads which are now flooded. Um, and yeah, it, it's just an incredible place. And on top of that, there's also a lot of big cats in this area, some really good game viewing. So things like leopard, when I mean, you've got leopard, and there's a lot of water around, you kind of hope that maybe you're going to find a leopard 
up a tree. No, um, they are leopards around and we do get them in the trees, but the kind of things that we hope for, and this is why I've, I've chosen the Vumbara concession for this, is because I know that there's always water around here. There's often roads that are flooded. There's a lot of movement of cats between islands and between areas here where they have to cross water, um, is to get these kind of shots. And I think from a photography perspective, um, capturing these images is one thing, but just being there to experience it is something completely different. Um, watching these cats, you know, they still, they're not that comfortable with the water, but they know that they, they have to move through these areas. Um, and so it's every photographer's dream to, you know, see something like this or to, to have a big male lion coming through a channel and a crossing. And again, being in a private concession means that you've got time to spend with these animals um, and that you can actually maneuver. So if I take this sighting back, um, whenever we're on safari here, the first thing in the morning is to focus on lions. We get out there, we try and find tracks. Um, I've spent three hours tracking um, a coalition of four male lions with our, our guide there where we've gone through deep water channels and looked on the other side, the tracks are there. Carry on, carry on, another big deep crossing. And sure as nuts, they've crossed through all of these channels only to find them sleeping on an elephant path. But you know, on this particular morning, we actually found uh, the lionesses and, and the male. They were crossing through shallow water. They then walked and sat down on the edge of, the, of a deeper channel. And we sat and waited with them. And um, one of the females got up and we shot around. We actually drove through this channel, got to the other side to get into prime position to have the animal walking onto us. And um, we had the first lioness come through, the second lioness popped through. And by that time, we got all the settings right and you, you really couldn't miss. We knew that the male was going to follow them. And... Um, Literally, just after I'd taken this photograph and before this male came out into the, the open water, I thought, oh, this will be fantastic. I've got some shots of the females. I've got a shot of the male. Let me film this for the guests. And I set my camera up, got things going, and it was amazing. I just heard shutters going, and I watched on the back of the screen as this male came through the water, kind of just in the chest deep, and then came up. Everyone was just wide-eyed, couldn't believe it, was so excited. I asked to check with the cameras. Yes, everyone got the shot. Fist bumps, fist bumps. And then I was very proud of myself. I said, you know, guys, I've even filmed that for you. And I got it on all on video. And I pushed play and there was nothing. And um, that tends to happen when you don't hit the record button. So I actually watched this male line crossing through this channel in live view mode on the back of my camera without actually hitting record. And um, hopefully that'll help you just feel a little bit better if you've made some sort of mistakes out in the field, it happens to the best of us. But the line viewing and general game, uh, predator viewing out in this part of the world is, is unbelievable. Being able to spend time um, with these animals, not having the pressure, being able to go off road and find them in the first place. Good wild dogs as well. But the most fascinating, the most exciting part of a stay at this concession. And if you're ever going to do a helicopter flip, I would say that this is the most incredible part of the Okavango Delta to do it. Getting up nice and early before the sun has risen, heading off to the jetty because you've got a boat into the camp at Little Vumbara every time. And um, we get into a little Robbie 44. All the doors have been removed for photography. We take a maximum of two guests at a time and they both are seated on the left-hand side. We've got a great agreement with uh, Helicopter Horizons that with two guests flying, the guide um, flies free of charge and but in on the back right of the planes of the chopper. So essentially it is an additional activity um, and it is well worth it. We re I'd recommend between a 45 to 45 minute to an hour flight. And um, so I would sit on the back right hand corner with the guests both seated on the left and we would fly. And whenever we do see something, we kind of bank to the left hand side. So the guests are always got prime view and I'll be coaching them as well as just giving the guidance to the pilot in terms of the height and the angles that we would like to look at from a photography perspective. But uh, these guys from Helicopter Horizons are absolutely fantastic in, in terms of getting us into the right areas. And to fly and see the Delta from this perspective just adds a whole new dimension to your experience. And if you think about it, we've gone from game drives to light aircraft and flying over these areas in a, in a plane itself is incredible to see, but there's something else that takes place when the doors go off. But um, light aircraft, uh, speedboats, Mokoros, and now a helicopter. So it's, it's, it's an incredible experience. To get up to the top of the air, this is the Norka channel, that kind of moving through these papyrus beds at first light with the long deep shadows, it really is special. Um, I like to 
get the guests to focus on more abstract kind of shots, looking for patterns and texture and repetition. And there's really just no shortage of that around. Add to that the fact that there's a whole lot of wildlife in different scenes and different scenarios at first light. And this, in terms of bang for buck, in terms of the photographic opportunities that one gets is just incredible. Uh, this is one of my favorite shots from flying over this area. It's a female Sitatunga, um, which are very rare and very shy antelope. And we have seen them uh, several times from Pelo as well, with the obviously being more aquatic and water-based. But in the winter months, they tend to, to kind of come out onto the edges of these reed beds to, to warm themselves and sun themselves. And um, it's a fantastic opportunity at first light. And then things like hippopods, but even something as simple and as basic as a sausage tree on a termite mound can make for incredible photography from the air. And um, I would seriously encourage anyone who goes to the Delta to try and save up a little bit of cash. It's probably between five and $600 per person for an hour long flight. But um, it, I can tell you it is well worth it. It really, really is special. Um, and as we get to that, I'm starting to go over, I just wanted to say thank you and Pula, which means cheers and also means rain um, in Tswana. And thank you for joining me for this evening's webinar. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and if you haven't already do, done so, please do get your questions into the Q&A section of the, um, the webinars here. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna stop sharing so that I can come back to your big screen and I'm going to jump into the Q&A section here. So, um, right, I'm going to start at the top here. Um, uh, will this year, November, be like September of last year, perhaps? How will this year's flood change this table? So what I'm expecting for November this year is that the waters will still be quite high. There's a big volume of water that has moved into the Delta. Um, it certainly won't be anything like last year. That was um, a, an anomaly and a, co a combination of low rainfall and drought. And um, I, I really can't see that happening. I think there's still gonna be quite a bit of water around, but November from a game viewing perspective is fantastic as well. It's the start of the, the kind of the, um, the carving season. So there's a lot of impala lambs around, which is fantastic for photography, but also great for predators. Um, how can you get involved in conservation career in the Okavango area? Thank you for, from Bianca. Um, there are a couple of operations that are out there. It's Claws Conservancy. Um, I think that Panthera is, is working with some uh, groups on the ground outside of the Delta, um, on the fringes with communities. So Bianca, if you want to, you should have um, my uh, email address. If you want to drop me a, a message after this, that would be fantastic. I can try and kind of give you a, give you a hand on that one. Um, are there two game dives a day, as in South Africa, from Lucas? Yes, they are, morning and afternoon. But again, the morning game drives tend to be a lot longer out in the Delta. So it's not uncommon to come back at 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. We always take a packed breakfast with us. I should have mentioned this, but take a packed breakfast. We head out and you know, have a snack on the go. Because it's winter months, typically it's a little bit cooler. You can spend a bit more time out there and we wanna maximize our time in the field. Um, the one thing that the guys don't do a lot of there is night drives um, with, a, with a spotlight. So you can stay out, but once the sun has gone down, they'll come back with a spotlight, but it's, it's not like the Sabi Sands where you're actively searching for wildlife at night. Um, how hot does it get in the Delta in November? Is it humid? So it's not really, it can get a little bit humid in the late afternoon when the storms are brewing. It's uh, probably, I would say, high 20s, early 30s in terms of Celsius. Um, very comfortable. October can get very dry and very hot. And I'm talking kind of mid 40s up in Savuti. Um, I've had that in the shade where it was over 40 degrees Celsius and that's, that's hell of a hot. Um, Right, how do water levels usually compare in May versus November? So I would say that they're fairly similar, although towards with May, they've got the flood water starting to come through. This year they came a little bit earlier, so they, they're probably a little bit higher than they would be in November. And again, that's where having a, a series of camps in combination will give you exposure to the, the, the various uh, levels of water that are coming through in those different areas. Um, Lance Camp, how safe are the camps and wild animals? 
Are there wild dogs? I think I've got through that one. Charles Fraser, is the wildlife here as habituated to vehicles and humans as East Africa? Um, yeah, Charles, they, they are very relaxed. Um, but again, it's, it's about how the guides handle it. So, you know, if you just drive up to any old elephant or any old leopard, they're not, they're not going to be that uh, comfortable with it, especially the elephants, because they do move over large areas through community lands. So typically you find um, that some of these elephants tend to be a little bit more testy than in, in other areas. And that's because they've had exposure to communities on the fringes of the Delta. But by, for all intents and purposes, the, the leopards and the lions and that sort of thing are fairly accustomed and habituated to vehicles, but that still doesn't mean that they shouldn't be treated uh, with respect that they deserve. Um, when in the best, best time of day for viewing animals. Obviously, early mornings, middle of the day, a lot of the animals tend to settle down and kind of gets too hot to move around. Uh, Frank Derby, where might we find a collection of your photos from over the years? Um, Frank, I will send out a link to my personal website with uh, a collection um, and a gallery of the Okavango Delta specifically. What focal lengths do we usually bring to the Delta? So great question, uh, Lucas. Usually around about 400 mils is good. Um, you know, anything over that is fantastic, but I would say something like 100 to 400 is really, really good for your general kind of shots. Um, I like to take a 400 2.8 along with me and I take converters with that as well. But I do like to play on um, more abstract shots, you know, tight portraits at 800 mils. So you could always get away with more glass out there. Something like a 70 to 200 um, for the aerial shots and a 2470 for the bigger pictures, uh, wider scenes are really, really good. But having said that, you can also stitch um, panos together with something like a 70 to 200. But um, if there was one go-to lens to give you kind of the versatility that you would need, the something like the 100 to 400 or the 80 to 400 would be great. Um, Turgo, how did I get such a low angle referring to the dog photo? Great to have you join us here, Turgo. I hope you're doing well. Um, if I recall correctly, I think it's more of uh, an effect of the focal length and the angle that we were at. So we weren't right on top of the dogs and that sighting was at the edge of the airstrip. So we may have actually been on the other side of the airstrip shooting just, you know, just on the edge of that. Um, Chris, is there likely to be a season this year with COVID? Well, I've got a trip still scheduled for November this year. I'm holding on um, for that, as are Charles and Natalie, who joined us here this evening. I'm sure they, they are holding on, especially after watching and going through all of these images. Um, so, yeah, I'm hopeful. I know from a South African perspective, um, there's a big lobby here to start opening up um, the hospitality industry and lodges from about the 1st of September, but that would be a phased approach um, before we get to opening up international airspace and having flights come through, because obviously to get to Mount and get into Botswana, you would have to come via South Africa. So um, it's a bit of a moving target with, as of so many things related to the whole COVID-19 pandemic, but yes, we're hopeful that there, there will be an opportunity to get up to the Delta this year. Um, Alicia, do advice on what kind of camera gear to bring? So I think we've covered that one. How are the zebra numbers in Savuti area in May? Julie, I actually have no idea. Um, I would imagine that most of them would be back up in that part of the world, feeding on the, on the marsh area there. Um, uh, but I haven't been up there myself at that time of year. You'll see that the trip that we kind of focused on here was around the Delta specifically. And, um, you know, adding nights, it's very easy to extend a safari like this. And whilst the rest of the group fly back to Mount, to extend and carry on to Savuti or to Chobe as well. So this was just a, an itinerary that I thought would be the best way to explore the Delta in its entirety. And for those who wanted to go on to the Savuti, to Lunyanti or to Chobe, uh, or even the central Kalahari, could very easily extend their stay, but outside of the scheduled departure with the rest of the group. Um, so I don't know. I haven't been up there in, in May. Um, uh, Cheryl Ogilvie, what are the costs involved? Length, days of safari. I remember Cheryl from, um, <laughs> from, from my days at uh, Pretoria Tech. Um, I was one of the first groups to go through the game launch management program there. So great to see that you've joined us and thank you for joining me. Um, we don't take students to help us run our camps. These are not my camps, by the way. I wish they were. They're all part of Wilderness Safaris um, portfolio. And um, I, I would love to, to be able to take students along with us. Um, Botswana is a pricey destination. So this nine night itinerary is probably running around the $16,000 per person mark based on a single 
guests. So there's a single occupancy of a room that's involved in that you don't have to share with anyone, which I think is probably going to become more important for people moving forward. Um, it is based on just four guests, so a small exclusive group. It includes all of the flights, all the meals, all the drinks, the additional weight on the internal flight so that the, the luggage restrictions have been bumped from, uh, from 20 kilograms up to 35 kilograms. And, you know, it certainly isn't a, uh, a cheap exercise, but I can guarantee you that, again, if you were to go to the Delta just once in your life, that these camps would provide you with such an amazing experience that you would walk away feeling that you had seen and experienced the Delta, the Delta in its entirety. Um, Natalie, just uh, thanking me for the Prezo and hoping to see me in November. I do hope so too. Uh, Maribel, do we encourage guests to do night photography? Yes, very much so. Um, it's great fun, especially if you can do it in a camp. It can be quite challenging when you've got multiple people with tripods and timers and torches going. It can be quite frustrating. That's why a nice small group, um, it tends to be a little bit better. And because we can do it in the camp, it really is quite comfortable. Some guests can go back to bed or go back to their rooms if they don't want to stay up for it, but it's done on site. And it's a great way of just um, documenting another part of that. I mean, so many guests will come out to Africa and say, wow, I've never seen so many stars and because there's no light pollution. And it's just, it would be a shame to come and experience that and not capture it when it's actually so easy. Um, so the host of the trip would, all, and pretty much all of our trips, the guys would always try and make an effort if there was an opportunity to get out and have the guests um, get their camera onto a tripod and uh, try and go through the, 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 the settings and the recipe for photographing the sky at night. Um, if there are any more questions, if you guys want to drop them in there, I'm just going to go through to the chat otherwise and see what else is going on here. Um, great. It's an absolute pleasure, guys. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, there will be a follow-up email that will go out, um, but I will send you guys all a, a group email as well with uh, some contact details. Um, I'll also be sure to include a video um, of this. I thought about showing it, but you know, it would be such a waste of time. Rather listen to me rattling on for, for another five minutes, but I'll send you the uh, video for you guys to have a look at on our YouTube channel. Um, there's also some experiences on the, the helicopter flight in there as well. So quite a few links that I, I would actually be sending out to you all. But thank you all for, for joining me. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. I hope you found it valuable. If you have any questions or I haven't been able to answer your questions on the Okavango Delta, or you would like assistance in planning a trip to the Okavango Delta, and I would encourage you to do this well in advance because with availability from this year being shuffled over into next year, um, if it's something that you want to do and you don't want to compromise on the camps and the destinations, I would suggest planning into 2022 right now. It sounds bizarre, but I would suggest that that is a very good option. But thank you all for joining me. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the evening or morning, wherever you have tuned in from. And uh, from me, thank you very much. Good night. Bye.